It was a grueling six-day meeting in Bonn, but worth every minute. As one leading negotiator remarked during the concluding session, we consider this moment as very historic. We have seen the beginning of our own understanding of what we need. Our work program is starting to bear fruit, and with our hard work here, we have been able to start to learn by doing. We can look up tomorrow and say that a baby called IP Best has started to take strides. Established in 2012, IP Best is akin to IPCC in that it will carry out assessments of existing knowledge in response to governments and other stakeholders' requests to address biodiversity loss. IP Best also represents a continuation of the landmark Millennium Ecosystem Assessment undertaken by more than 1,000 experts worldwide. I had the honour to co-chair the MA and to release its final report in this very hall 10 years ago in 2005. The MA was hailed for its success as a platform to deliver clear, valuable, policy-relevant consensus on the state, trends, and outlooks of biodiversity. Ladies and gentlemen, the ultimate success of any science policy platform hinges on three elementary prerequisites. The first of these is credibility, the quality of being convincing, trusted, and believed in. It is earned at great effort, but easily lost. I was pleased to hear many statements made during last week's plenary that indicate the platform is finding its feet as a strong voice of science. This perception seemed reflected also in the technical and substantive nature of many of the discussions. As one seasoned delegate noted, the nature of the dialogue stood in contrast to other fora where the talk often becomes too caught up in the political process. After extensive discussions, delegates agreed to couple thematic assessments on land degradation and restoration, sustainable use of biodiversity and invasive alien species with regional and sub-regional assessment. This will help accelerate the assessment process itself, but also the development of policy support tools and the identification and addressing of capacity building needs. Among the lessons learned at IP Best during its three years of work is that effectively bridging the science policy divide requires substantial investment in policy support tools and technical support units of at regional and sub-regional levels. Many therefore welcome the operationalization of the UN Collaborative Partnership in which four agencies, UNDP, UNESCO, FAO, and UNEP, will provide coordinated support to maximize synergies with the IP Best work program. Ladies and gentlemen, the second essential element for the success of the science policy platform is relevance. During the closing plenary, many speakers reiterated that the value-added aspects of the IP Best Work Program are key to its continuing relevance in the crowded international environmental governance arena. Innovative elements of the work program include a methodological study on how to acknowledge, integrate, and bridge diverse concepts of biodiversity's values, 
and pilot studies at the regional level on working with indigenous and local knowledge. Several observers call for the platform to chart its own path and avoid becoming either the twin of the IPCC or the little sibling of the Convention on Biological Diversity. This view was reiterated by IPCC Chair Rajendra Pachauri, who said that while the IPCC might have inspired the IPBES, the new generation is often a few steps ahead of the previous one. And the final prerequisite for success at the science policy nexus is legitimacy, embracing and mobilizing a broad constituency of knowledge holders and users. In addition to ensuring that IP best delivers authoritative scientific products that meet policymakers' needs, many delegates underscore the need to ensure that IP best is seen as a legitimate platform. More work is needed to enlarge the IP best tent to reach out to others and create a truly inclusive network, one that provides a level playing field for multiple knowledge systems, not just established scientists. Ladies and gentlemen, the IP best experience has increasingly left me assured that we are on the right track to creating a strong science policy nexus able to assist humanity in showing, in slowing, then halting biodiversity loss as the first steps towards remediation. There are, however, critical constituencies yet to be fully engaged, including the general public. If we are to mainstream biodiversity concerns into development planning, we must offer a compelling rationale and demonstrate biodiversity's relevance to wealth generation, job creation, and general human well-being. Only a persuasive why resonating throughout society will successfully get us to urgently needed negotiation of who, what, where, when, and how to halt today's disastrous pace of biodiversity loss. Public awareness and trust in science relies on good communication. Unfortunately, it seems a hallowed tradition for scientists to be ill-practiced and rather poor at communication with the public and their governments, especially when the issues seem complex and uncertain. Communicating all our findings will be critical in mainstreaming this agenda, using both the conventional media and new social media platforms, and framing the issue as one of development rather than of strictly conservation. We also need the business community engaged and innovative private-public partnerships. Finally, we must incorporate biodiversity studies at every educational level. So I invite the support and valuable help all of you in this audience can provide. And I thank you for your kind Attention. Domo, arigato gozaimashita. So this is the Cade Island Committee on Nature Conservation established in 1992. In 1992, the United Nations Conference on Environment, Environment and Development was held in Rio. And following uh, this conference in the same year, the K. Darnin has decided and established this Committee on Nature Conservation. 
There are 13 or nine companies as a membership of k Landing Committee, and there are nationwide industry associations of 112 as a member, and also 47 regional economic organizations, of which there are 117 companies that participate in uh, this committee. So um, major activities are listed here. We collect donations from companies and individuals. And then uh, the fund we collected uh, will be used to support NGOs, nature conservation, and biodiversity protection projects. Once every year, the members of the committee uh, will try to learn exactly how our money is used. So we uh, visit uh, the project site. And this is the some of the pictures. We uh, visited uh, the, the forest where orangutans uh, live. And also uh, we visited Myanmar Nature Conserva Conservation Center. Uh, we uh, also promote our awareness on nature conservation and biodiversity for member companies. And then we also contribute for restor restoration of Tohok through rehabilitation of the nature. It's been 21 years since this commission was established. Over the 21 uh, years, we had supported 1,100 projects and uh, with the monetary contribution of 3.2 billion yen. There are some categories to the projects we support, namely a natural resource management project, forestation projects, environmental education projects, and rare species projects, and also researches. By region, we have supported mainly in Asia, Japan, Pacific, and Latin American regions. Now I would like to uh, give you uh, an overview of our company, Maida Corporation. Maida Corporation is a construction company founded in 1919. There are about 2,800 employees, including group companies we have about 3,800 employees altogether with a net sales of 323.8 billion unconsolidated. And then our corporate motto uh, is sincere, sincerity, willpower, and technology. I often tell employees that it is sincerity times willpower times technology, meaning that in multiplication, if any of three becomes zero, then the product becomes zero. And the corporate logo was created 24 years ago. Blue sky and uh, green earth uh, were used in the design. 24 years ago with the keywords of harmony with surrounding environment, showing our mindset for the environment of the earth. So it, this was created 24 years ago already. We had this corporate identity, and I have a great respect for my forerunners of MIDA Corporation. So 1919, our company was founded. And initially, uh, we were engaged in uh, a civil engineering, uh, constructing dams, constructing uh, power plants. Uh, we've uh, constructed world, uh, Japan's biggest dam. And in 1970s, uh, we came to engage more in the urban civil engineering, uh, a second tunnel. Aqua Rhine, Fukuoka Dome Stadium, 
uh, some of the major projects, and we also went overseas as well. Uh, this is the Hong Kong Stone Cutters Bridge. When uh, this was completed, this was uh, the world's uh, biggest cable stayed a bridge in the world. And we also have a management uh, challenges that we uh, tackled in 1980s because of the accident in which we lost 16 precious lives. Uh, we decided to give uh, safety for most priority. So we introduced TQC and we spent 10 years of building the foundation of the safety within the company in 1990s. The product uh, control uh, became uh, the next uh, target. So uh, Deming Award uh, Prize, Deming Prize for Individuals, Japan Quality Medals were some of the recognitions that we uh, were granted. And in two, after 2000, uh, we came to focus more on compliance. In 2009, I became the president of the company. The first thing I declared uh, was that uh, we are going to introduce environmental uh, management. And uh, I said uh, we wanted to become uh, the construction industry's undisputed leader in environmental management. And why did I say that? Why did I make such a declaration? Well, I am specialized in civil engineering, and I have had many experiences. So I would like to share with you some uh, experiences. In 1982, when I was 28, I was transferred to Malaysia's dam construction site in Sarawak province. Uh, they had a very large scale forest, uh, and then we were to construct a dam in uh, the forest. And then I felt that uh, we have to preserve the forest as we construct the dam. We needed to protect the landscape. So I learned about the importance of conserving nature and landscape. And I also uh, visited uh, nature reserve in Nairobi, Kenya in 2006 uh, to visit one of the project sites. As you can see in the picture, I saw an impala being eaten by hyenas and vultures. And hyenas, when they finished, vultures came to finish up. So I saw the um, chain of life was created in Nairobi. And the third experience uh, was in Indonesia. I visited the habitat of orangutans. This is again to visit one of the project sites. And uh, right next to the habitat of orangutans, uh, there was the world's biggest open pit coal mines. And they were producing very high quality coals that are exported to Japan. So I saw uh, the environment and global economies uh, link uh, in, uh, in the habitat of orangutans. So as a, a company, what can we do and what should we do? We are a construction company. We use a lot of timbers. We use a cement. We use Earth's valuable resources to do our business. Coals, for example, are used by us, but coals are nurtured by Earth uh, over a long time. So we need to consider Earth as our important stakeholder in our business because the Earth is providing us with their assets, with their resources. Therefore, to this stakeholder, 
we need to pay dividend. Therefore, we introduced the concept of dividend for the Earth. We use 2% of our net profit every year as dividend for the Earth. As a business, at the project site, we try to reduce CO2 emission. We created Maeda environmental rules that are applicable to each construction site. We also introduced Maeda Eco Point program for individuals. It is called Mi Point or Mi Point or Mi Pon. This Eco Point program is applicable to all family members as well. And now let me talk a bit more about dividend for the earth. Two percent of the net profit is paid out as dividend for the ass every year. So that's a company initiative. And this is a individual component. We also invest in individual component as well. So uh, this is the uh, company initiatives. Uh, first one is nationwide Maida forest, and the Maida ecosystem concerns biodiversity support. The third one is Maida eco schools at the primary and high schools, and at the university, Maida corporation offer environmental education. The fourth one is Maida eco aid. This is international or contribution, mainly in Southeast Asia, taking place at the Maeda construction site. Uh, we also have a, as a, a Maeda uh, green activities, one of which is started two years ago called Maeda Green R&D. Environmental management requires us to generate some profit as well. Therefore, we invest in venture companies and research institutes. If a certain venture business is manufacturing something good for the environment, then we invest in them. With our financial support, the venture company would manufacture eco-friendly products or services. And if they become profitable, they are to give us a return in the form of dividend. We also support academic institutes, research institutes. And once uh, they develop their research, and if they can monetize their research, and they are to pay us dividends. That's my that green R&D initiative. And then uh, the lower portion is for individuals. That is my that Echo Point program. Employees are encouraged uh, to engage themselves in environmental activities, but not only employees, but also their spouses and children are encouraged to engage themselves in uh, environmental activities. As a result of their activities, they can earn some echo points, which can be exchanged with uh, some uh, prizes. Now, well, there were two questions to each presenter. So first of all, I'd like to ask Mr. Obana to address Mr. Hoshino and Mr. Fabio's question. So whether we can make it ends meet in terms of business management by paying a dividend. Of course, uh, we would pay dividend while we are thinking about managing our business. To our shareholders, we pay a dividend. Currently, it's 7 yen per share. So basically, we adopted the same approach to the Earth. So 2% of the net profit is what we pay as dividend. It's not 10% or 20%. That would make us 
very difficult in terms of business. So that's why we set the percentage as 2% in order to maintain continuity. So yes, we can manage our business with this approach. And also, we currently use the term environmental management. So as I said earlier, green R&D is one of the important initiatives. There are many venture companies, there are many universities researching eco-friendly technologies and services. So two years ago, we started invest in those entities. So when a venture company becomes successful and profitable with our investment, then we are to receive return uh, from uh, them in a form of dividend. Therefore, in a total, we use the higher level uh, terminology environmental management, but it seems to be working uh, to us, working for us. I hope this answers to your question. About the term sustainability, uh, currently we pay dividend to the earth, so that's a voluntary activities on our part. But uh, as just one company, when it comes to the global sustainability, uh, our efforts is not really enough to really promote uh, the entire global sustainability. If there are more collective uh, power with 100, 200 companies, uh, who uh, would roll out to similar activities like us, and then uh, we will have a major uh, collective power to promote sustainability. So in that sense, private sector companies uh, should be aware of their uh, role as uh, leaders uh, in this field. So um, Maeda Corporation is a small company right now, but hopefully we will be able to involve more and more uh, companies uh, for sustainability. So uh, next I would like to call upon um, Professor Zakri Ahmed to answer to the two questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Both are very good questions, and this relates to uh, the other stakeholders uh, beyond uh, governments. Mm. I think in my uh, presentation, I mentioned that uh, IP Best has uh, 123 member states as uh, uh, members of the platform. But already now, in the meeting last week, there are 130 uh, observers. So we are expecting more and more non-government uh, organization uh, uh, to be involved, and this is a very good thing. Uh, we have such a thing as a stakeholder forum where uh, the platform would listen uh, to the views of the uh, private sector uh, in uh, particular. And the case of the MIDA Corporation is a very good uh, example of how uh, the private sector uh, could be involved in the issue that is dealt with uh, by uh, IP uh, PES. Uh, it is a science policy network, but very much, I think, uh, we look forward to the involvement of the uh, private sector. Mm. The second question about engagement with other UN Agencies, uh, definitely. In my speech, I also mentioned uh, the arrangement, formal arrangement that the platform has now with uh, UNESCO, UNDP, uh, UNEP, uh, and the FAO. For instance, one of our early products that is going to appear next year is about uh, pollination and food security. Mm -hmm. So definitely FAO uh, would figure uh, very big uh, in that. But also, is it, the platform is a very inclusive uh, uh, mechanism. We are also link, linking big time with uh, uh, this uh, future Earth, uh, which is led by uh, ICSU. 
And uh, even in this country, I think uh, the UN University, through the leadership of Professor Takeuchi, is uh, engaging with the platform. And so are a number of uh, uh, research organizations in, in Japan, for instance, the IJS, NIES, and, and, and some others. We are also linking with various Academy of Sciences universities worldwide. So uh, it is a very interesting development. Thank you. So in the first um, questions answer, within the IPBES, there is no, uh, is there any official mechanism to allow private sector to participate in IPBS activities? Let me answer that in two ways. My experience as the co-chair of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, uh, which was launched in uh, 2005, no. there is a structure where not only governments are involved, but also the private sector. But the IPBS uh, is an intergovernmental right. platform. Uh, so by nature, the negotiations are being done by governments. But that doesn't preclude the involvement of the private se sector. They could uh, channel their views through the respective uh, member states. Member states. Yeah. Okay. I think this is a question uh, for Professor uh, Zachary Abdul Hamid, I, th I would like to have both speakers to answer to your question. So it's not only about energy, but uh, we have um, environmental policy in Japan, so how should be the way forward for Japan? And I would also like to ask uh, Professor Takeuchi to comment on this particular question. So there have been two questions. So uh, Professor uh, Zachary, please. First of all, I would categorically steer away from any comments on abinomics because I'm not uh, familiar with it. Uh, but all I can see is that the science uh, policy nexus is a very important uh, development in the governance of uh, the environment. And uh, we have seen the highly successful uh, Nobel Prize winning IPCC uh, doing that and uh, uh, leveraging on the kind of policies that needs to be taken on uh, uh, climate change, whether it's at the global, regional, and the uh, local uh, level. So I would venture to, to argue that this platform would be a constructive and poli uh, positive development. And already uh, the delegation of Japan during its numerous interventions at the plenaries uh, of the IPBES uh, is playing a very constructive uh, role. Uh, I wouldn't want to go into details on that, but I'll just say it's a very good thing. The, the first question by Mr. Salvatore Arico from UNESCO is a good one, and that is how could we engage uh, the youth? At the end of the day, and I think that relates also to Professor Das Gupta's uh, reference to intergenerational uh, equation. At the end of the day, uh, the, the future of sustainable development would depend on, on the youth uh, of the world. So I, I would really encourage, in particular in this audience, if they are young people, uh, to uh, pay serious uh, attention to that. Uh, just to share with you, during last week's uh, plenary, uh, amidst the uh, uh, active engagement of uh, various governments in the discussion, one of the most inspiring moments is at the end of the uh, uh, session when we had uh, interventions from a couple of uh, youth groups uh, which uh, really position how the young people uh, look at the future of the earth, and it's a very positive one. 
so I think uh, more and more we should be uh, focusing and encouraging on, on, on the younger uh, generations. Uh, less of the grey generation, but mm. on those uh, still youthful hair. Chairman, thank you. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Obara, Japanese environmental policy and economics and environmental policy relationship, and especially in relation to from the viewpoint of private sector company, um, how do you view the environmental policy, if you have any ideas? Well, Avenomics is a, a nationwide issue. So as a one construction company in Japan, I don't feel I am in the position to say anything authoritative. But as a construction company, Japan as a country, I believe it's paying serious attention to the environment. In our industry, in 2012, two years from now, based in compliance with uh, the, base, the Japanese building standards uh, will be strictly uh, implemented. There will be no permits approval given to any construction plans that will not fulfill the environmental requirements. So that's part of the policy issued by the government. So towards reducing the CO2 emission, I feel uh, the serious attitude of the government uh, is indicated many parts of the policy. The energy policy, as for energy policy, sometimes I feel that it is difficult uh, to have a conclusive environmental policy when Japanese government is yet to determine the energy policy. For example, how many nuclear reactors should resume uh, reactivated and uh, what will be the portion of the hydroelectric uh, or thermal electric power stations. So without a definite uh, energy policy, I think sometimes it is difficult to finalize and determine the adequate environmental policy. Also, the Central Environmental Council um, member is one of the positions that uh, Dr. Takeuchi holds, so I would like him to also comment. The so Society in Harmony with Nature was mentioned in 2007 uh, during the first Abe cabinet. So at the, uh, the uh, general assembly, a uh, general meeting of the United Nations, uh, the Prime Minister Abe said that we should have the uh, CO2 emission by 2050. But uh, in the second of the cabinet, I think his tone, he has toned down quite significantly, which is unfortunate. As President uh, Obara said, in the past, environmental policy assumed we will continue to have nuclear power. And based on that assumption, we developed environmental policy and energy policy. But we are yet to determine our future policy for energy sources. And then socially, it doesn't look acceptable to allow uh, the increase of nuclear power. So if uh, things are unattended, it seems we would only increase the thermal um, power so, uh, which is not also not very desirable. So there are some discussions going on under the current economic uh, measures. But I feel uh, the issues we discussed should be featured more prominently. For example, one of the major issues for uh, the government is the revitalization of regions because those rural uh, and distant regions are declining. So those uh, regional cities, regions, uh, must be united as a community in order to revitalize their economy. Um, 
So we have to make a shift from the society uh, based on uh, the produced capital uh, to the society based on natural capital, uh, or uh, we should try to increase the human capital uh, in order uh, to revitalize the community in the regions. So economic uh, measures and those ideas must be linked. And broadly speaking, the discussions around how we should pursue all beings of uh, Japanese people need to be linked. And then uh, we should be able to consolidate uh, the environmental and energy policies. We also understand, uh, we also uh, be able to promote the understanding of the civil society as well. So as a council, we have put forward the recommendation from this viewpoint. So if you have an opportunity, I hope you would read our recommendation as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I had to ask someone on the floor uh, to ask some of the questions. Thank you very much.